worship this morning. Um, we do have a few quick uh, announcements today. Uh, we will not be having kids group tonight. Uh, Miss Amanda has uh, hurt her back, so you know, the pastor needs to be home with her. So uh, unless you want, anybody wants to come teach it, uh, we will resume that next week. Uh, also, uh, please be in prayer for Carol Moore. Uh, I found out this morning that uh, his, uh, his house off of Cooperative Way uh, caught fire last night. Uh, now, you know, Carol has been in assisted living um, for a while now, and there's mementos and things over there. Um, everything's okay, or he's okay, but just keep him in your prayers um, in the coming days. Uh, that's, it's got to be hard uh, for that to happen. Um, also, uh, the, tonight, uh, the ladies will start their Bible study at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, we'll be going through the book of James. Um, if you've got your books already, great. Um, if you have not, if you would like to order it yourself, see me and I'll show you how to do that. Or if you need me to order it, let me know. And the cost because the, the book is $14. Um, and so if you would like to do that, just let me know. I'll be glad to order that for you. But we start that today at 4. Uh, we will have a Wednesday night Bible study at 6.30 this week. And our word will be mortification. But that is... Uh, all that I have for you, as you can see, uh, we're thankful Frances is back and she has wrote, written a note to all of us um, in the bulletin, if you take time to, to look at that today. But um, that is all that I have. And now let's turn to God's business uh, as we hear our call to worship uh, from Psalm number 89, verse number 1. Hear now God's word. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray together. Lord, you are a faithful and true God. You are the high and holy God that is righteous and perfect. And we come here today to honor you. Or as we take this time out of our week to come and to focus upon you, Lord, I pray that you would help us to put aside all of life's anxieties and fears, all of the business from everywhere else, and Lord, enable us to focus here upon you today to give you your credit, your due. For Lord, we come and we remind you that you are a faithful God who has delivered us, who has redeemed us, one that deserves all of our praise, all of the honor, all of the glory. And Lord, today we pray that you would accept our worship. Lord, as fallen as we might be, Lord, we magnify you today as the one who has stooped down to pick us up and to redeem us, even in our brokenness. And so, Lord, today may this time be a blessing to us. Draw us nearer to your throne of grace. And may you show all of us your majesty and your wonder and your awesomeness here today. Be with us and bless us, we pray in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Our first scripture lesson this morning is a familiar one to all of us. It's coming from the book of Psalms in Psalm number 23. Hear now God's word. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Our gracious God, again, we are reminded of your splendor and your majesty. We are reminded of your mercy and your grace, and how you, the creator of the universe, the one who has made us and numbered the hairs upon our head did not leave us alone. The Lord came into this world to redeem us, 
to shepherd us, to shepherd your sheep, to care for us, to provide for us, to lead us in your paths. Lord, we deserve none of this. We look at our lives and we see that we have failed you over and over, but yet we are reminded not of our good, but of your faithfulness. You are faithful to your people, even when we are not. And Lord, what a blessing and a joy that is. That you have come and redeemed us and made us your sheep. Lord, to lead us and to guide us in all of our life. Lord, today I pray that you would be with each one of us. Lord, we are all going through different things, different uh, situations, different trials. Some of it might be physical, some of it might be mental, some of it might be dealing with, with those that we work with, with those in our family. Lord, we are all struggling and, and dealing with, with difficulties in many different ways. But Lord, remind us that we can run to you. So often we want to deal with these things ourselves and we often feel like we're drowning. But Lord, you remind us that you are our God who's with us carry our burdens, to uplift us when we are downtrodden. And Lord, today may we come, may we lay our burdens at your feet. Remind us that you are with us. Remind us that you encourage us, give us the hope we need, the peace we need. And right now, Lord, may we each look at our life and be reminded that we have a God who can overcome all things, who can do the impossible who can minister to us even in the hardest times of our lives. And Lord, may today you give us this hope we can find in you. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to help us to grow each and every day. Help us to stop leaning upon ourselves, upon our ability, and look to you daily. Lord, may you equip us to go out into this world and to shine your light in the darkness. Lord, in our lives, we have many people that we know that need Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would give us a heart for these people. And Lord, that you would give us a way to minister and to evangelize. To them. Lord, help give us open doors that we might share Jesus. It might be in passing conversation. It might be in deeds we might do. It might be in inviting them here to hear your word preached. But Lord, I pray that all of us as those that have been redeemed, those that have found our comfort and our hope in Jesus, Lord, that you would give us a heart that others would know you too. Lord, may you continue to equip our church, to, up, to build up our church on a daily basis and help us to live as a life for you. Lord, right now we come before you and we are reminded of the tragedy that's happened this past week that's touched uh, many dear in our sister community of Rock Hill as well as in our ARP family. Lord, in the tragedy that's happened this week with the, the Leslie family, Lord, I pray that you would just bind up the brokenhearted. Lord, that they would come to you and lean upon you for hope and for strength. Lord, we are reminded that we live in a fallen world. But we are also reminded, even in the middle of the, the terrible things that we see, that there is always hope in Jesus. And so, Lord, may the hope of Christ be the hope for this family in the middle of their grief. May it be a hope for us who see all this unfolding, even in our own lives, what we go through. May we be reminded of the hope that we have in Christ. And so, Lord, may you be with this family and all those affected. Lord, may you be with us in what we are going through. And remind us that even when all in this world might be taken away, our hope in you can never be. Lord, may you continue to just be with us and help us daily to follow you, to love you, to live for you. And to come to you now, Lord, even when the words we might not know what to say, when we come to you in this moment of silent prayer, giving them to you.
blessed thing it is that when we don't know what to pray, we can always pray the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> verses 31 through 36. And as we begin here, uh, we'll be jumping back in, looking at the book of John, uh, where we picked up for Easter. And uh, if you remember, we, Jesus is teaching at the Feast of Booze, one of those three great feasts that uh, the people of God have throughout the year. And as time has gone on, he has been teaching, and it has been very controversial. But part of the reason is that Jesus was showing people who he was and why they needed him. And so here today, we continue on as Jesus is doing that. And he also reveals yet again another reason for the Jews here at the festival, but and also for us today, why we need him ourselves. But before we, we come and we see what it is that Jesus shows us today, let's go to him in prayer. Gracious God, again, we come humbly before you today. Lord, as sinners whose minds have been blinded by our sin, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and our eyes here today. Lord, that we would open your word and see your truth. Reveal to us what you are trying to say. Lord, may this time be edifying to us as we understand that how these words written so many years ago apply to us here in these moments and would help us to see how we can live for you and love you all more from it. Lord, may you be with me now as you have given me this daunting task of bringing your word to your people. Lord, and I recognize that I am fallen and broken. But Lord, may your spirit use me in my words or that they might be effective to draw these people closer to you and to glorify your holy name. Be with us, we pray, in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Again, John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. Hear now God's word. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The grass withers, the flower of faith, the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. The United States of America, the land of the free and the home, of the enslaved. What did he just say? 
That's not right. The home of the, the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're not enslaved. We live in a free country, right? We can do what we want to do. We can be who we want to be. We have no chains on us. We live at the center of the free world. What are you talking about that we are enslaved? Now, this is not some left-wing stab at wokeness today. Don't, don't worry about that. But I do think, I, I love my country. But I think that we are indeed, although we claim to be free, one of the most enslaved nations in this world. How so? Well, think about it. We might not be enslaved in chains, but we are enslaved to our jobs. We work over 40 hours a week to put food on the table, to keep up with the Joneses, and we lose that time with our family and our loved ones. We're addicted to technology. We're enslaved to it. Technology is not necessarily a bad thing, but having to, to take the time to try to keep up with it. And you see how that affects so many people. When was the last time that you have seen people actually come and eat dinner together without picking up their phones? We live in a country that is enslaved to addictions. Addictions to drugs, to alcohol, to food, to pornography. I think you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Although we claim to be free, that's really not the case. Because above all, we might be a country that's free economically and socially and politically. But if you look at our country, we see that we are enslaved to our sin. If you look and see how sin has conquered this land, it's very sad. You see adultery everywhere, lying, stealing, greed, gluttony, all of these things that sin has a hold on us in a land that claims be free. Now you still might think, well, hold on, hold on. That's a little much, isn't it? I mean, I can live the way that I want. I can do what I want to do. How in the world are you saying that I'm a slave? Nobody's forcing me to do anything. Well, the Jews in Jesus' day are thinking the same thing. But yet, Jesus tells them that they're enslaved. And he's telling us the same thing, too. We're enslaved to our sin. As we go through our passage today, Jesus helps us to understand really what that means in our life, what that looks like. And as then we understand that, we see that we truly aren't free. And that we need a different kind of freedom. Not a worldly freedom, but true freedom. The freedom that can only come to the Lord Jesus himself. And so as he shows us this here, the first thing that, that he explains to us is why it is that we are in bondage. Why is it, why it is that he says we're slaves? He's telling us we're slaves to sin and we might not even realize it. And the Jews here in the story actually give us a good example of it. Now we're told right before this that that Jesus is teaching there were people that believed in him. And so what Jesus did is now he gives them a test to see the genuineness of that faith. And so he says in verses 31 through 32 with me, if you would take a look. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What Jesus is saying here to these people, he says, if you are those that are really going to follow me, if you're those that are really going to be my disciples, then you don't, won't simply just affirm and say you have faith. No, you will live it and endure in that faith. I think there's many today that accept Christ, but their life does not show it at all. There's no change that's apparent in them. And that's why Jesus is saying here that those that are truly his disciples will abide in his word. That Meaning that they will remain in it, that they will continue on in it. 
dwelling in him and his word and all that he teaches. And as they do that, they will come to know the truth, the truth of he is, the truth of who God really is, and all that the scriptures show. And then by knowing that truth, that will set them free. Now, beginning of this might not sound half bad, but that's in part really doesn't sit well with the Jews here. Because if Jesus is offering them freedom, then he must be assuming that they are slaves. And so they respond in verse 33. They say, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And I think we can have that, that thought as well. You know, what, what is Jesus talking about? I'm enslaved. I can go where I want to go. I can do what I want to do. Nobody is forcing me to do anything. What does he mean that I am in bondage? And the Jews were thinking the same thing. What does he mean that we are enslaved? We are free. We're children of Abraham. Now, your first thought might be thinking, well, the Jews have a very short memory here. Exodus, right? They were enslaved in Egypt. They were enslaved in Babylon. Even right there, Rome is in charge. We might think, uh, can you not see what's going on? But that's not what the Jews are talking about here. They're talking about a spiritual freedom in the sense that God has chosen them as his people. They've always been his people. They're descendants of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. Nobody else has captured their hearts. No, they serve him. How could they have been in bondage? I think that might makes us ask the same question too. How are we in bondage? We, again, we live in a free country. We do as we please. We aren't oppressed by chains. We think, well, we are fine. But here Jesus is not talking about political economic freedom. Instead, he is revealing that our bondage isn't something that's outward in the manner of chains or slave drivers. But it's inward. For he says here in verse 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. When Jesus says, truly, truly, here it's, it's a point that we need to listen up. And he's saying that you might not think you're a slave, but you sin, right? And if you make a practice of sinning, well, you're enslaved too. I think if we think about it for a moment, we all easily fall into that category. You see, our master is not Caesar or Rome. It's not the American government. That's our fallen condition. Our sinful hearts, our sinful passions and desires. So we think about it. We crave our sin. We love it. It has a hold on us, a grip on us. We are addicted to it. Now when I say that, you might think, well, what are you talking about, Pastor? That's not me. Because when we often when we think of the word addiction, we think of things like drugs or alcohol, right? But we can also be addicted to power, to pride, to gossip. We can be slaves to ambition, to money, alcohol, to pleasure, to entertainment, to gambling, to gluttony, you name it. But yet we still say, well, I'm free. Those things don't hold sway over me. I just, I, I do them. But no, I'm in charge. Or we say, well, yeah, I might dabble a little here. But, you know, what's that to you? Why is that such a big deal to you, Pastor? You know, many people in this world say, no, I'm fine. I'm not enslaved to my sin. I do do good things. I'm a good person. I live my life in a way that doesn't infringe upon anybody else. You might get all up in arms and say, what I'm doing is a sin, but you know what? I'm not enslaved to it. I'm living how I want to live. <laughs> but when we hear that, when, when the preacher steps on our toes or somebody points out our sins, we're very quick to say, just like a, a, an addict does, I don't have a problem. Like the Jews here, they get all up in arms. And instead we say, I don't have a problem. You're the problem. And the reason for that, as John 3.19 says, is we love our sin. We love the darkness more than we love the light of Christ. 
And so we ignore our sin. We act as if it's no big deal, if it has no long-term consequences. We act like we have control over it. We can quit it any time we want. But that's exactly what the devil wants to make us think. So that we continue to do it. Oblivious to the fact that our sin has us locked behind bars, destroying us in the process. Uh, another minister uh, told a story about how there was an Eskimo, and uh, he was looking to, to kill a wolf. And so what he would do is he would go take a knife and he would dip it in blood, let the blood freeze. Then he would go dip it in blood again, let it freeze again, and so he would let it freeze layer upon layer to a sense you have a blood popsicle of sorts. Then he would go out in the snow and he stuck the blade in up in the ground, and went back and waited. And so the wolf would smell that blood. They would go and start licking that seemingly harmless knife. But as the wolf continued to lick and lick and lick, there came a point when the frozen blood was gone and it was hurting itself. But because the wolf loved the blood and was drawn into a frenzy and crazed by it, he didn't realize what it was doing. But by the time the next morning came, the Eskimo would come out. You would have a dead wolf. Now, I know that might seem a little grotesque for a moment, but I think it really paints a picture for us of how our sin enslaves us. We want it. We love it. We don't think there's anything wrong with it. But if we don't stop doing it, enjoy it as we may right now, in the end, we will pay the ultimate cost. Like an alcoholic who continues to drink even though their liver is failing. In our sinfulness, in our bondage, if we fail to see that sin is a big deal, then in Jesus, as Jesus says in this, earlier in this chapter, we will die in our sins. For the wages that we earn for our sin is death. And so as we hear that, this is not something that we should, that should make us offended like the Jews here. This should make us wake up to, we, we have a problem. We have issues. I mean, look at your life right now. What has a grip on you? It might not be something large like, like lust or, or, or murder or things of that nature, but from the, the best of us to the least of us, we all have some kind of sin that we struggle with. And we all have to see that we are slaves to it. The sins might differ, but we are all slaves just the same. And that's why Jesus tells us this here, to show us that if we are in bondage, that we need to be set free. And how does that happen? Well, we need an intervention. We need to realize that we are in bondage to our sin and seek help from someone else. Someone that can break those chains where we cannot. We need somebody who can, as Jesus says here, take us from being slaves to sons. And the only person that can do that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see, Jesus wants to show us our need here, even though we might not realize we need help. He makes the point that we are all slaves. And because of that, he says in verses 35 and 36, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The Jews think they are sons of Abraham. But really, Jesus is showing them that they are just slaves to their sin. Saying, you know, a slave, they don't have free run of the house. They can't live how they want to. They're only in the house for a, a temporary time. That they are unable to, to do as they please because they are in captivity. They are enslaved. And in order for a slave to have true freedom, to go about the house as they wish and please, that slave needs to be a son. Jesus is saying, you may be Abraham's descendants, but you're no child of God. Because there's no substitute for that. As we read in Psalm 23, that wonderful passage that we love so much. That's an encouragement for us because it reminds us that, that the Lord is guiding us, that he's keeping us, that, that he's there with us in the best and the worst moments of life. But ultimately the end, right? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Dwelling not as slaves, but as his children. 
those that have been set free from the bondage of sin, no longer slaves to it. Those that have been freed from its dominion and its guilt and its punishment. But the only way that's possible is through the Son. If He sets you free, as Jesus says here. It's actually it's very interesting if you look at verse 36. It says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. But look back at verse 32. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So if the Son sets you free, and also the truth sets you free, it makes us think of a different Bible verse, doesn't it? What does John 14, 6 say? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We see that Jesus is the truth that we need that will set us free. The one that will redeem us out of our sin and our bondage, bring us into God's family. And that's the truth that Jesus is talking about. We need to know. Knowing that Jesus is the only way to have the bonds of sin broken in your life. That's the gospel truth right here. As Jesus tells us back in the book of Luke, he says the devil, he's like a strong man who has his goods in his house. And enslaved to sin, we are the devil's goods. We're locked down in the basement, can't get out. But Jesus tells us that someone else stronger comes along, greater than the devil, and binds him and liberates his goods. Well, we know who does that. Jesus, Jesus comes along and he defeats the devil through his death, through his resurrection. And so now the devil is powerless and Jesus can come into that house, go down in that basement, take off our chains and lead us out into the freedom of his life. So this Galatians 4, 7 says, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Jesus is telling the Jews here, he's telling us. Look, you are slaves in your sin. I know you don't want to hear it. I know that steps on your toes. But Jesus is saying, look, you are slaves to sin. But I have come to break your chains. If you turn to me away from your sin and put your faith in me, I will set you free. And that's where the test that Jesus has for these believers comes into play. Will they turn from their sin and turn to Jesus? Will they come to him that offers them true freedom and abide in his word? Or will they continue on in their sin, blinded to their bondage and its devastating effects? And I think the bigger question here is what will we do? And our sin tempts us to think, well, I don't need Jesus. I'm free. I can live however I want. As we already talked about, we're not. We're sinful. We're slaves to it. We need Jesus. But also our sin tempts us to say, okay, but what it means to follow Jesus is I have to give up all this other stuff in my life to follow him. Is that freedom really worth it? Well, yes. Yes, it is. Richard Phillips, a uh, commentator, pointed that, points this out in four ways. When we think about the freedom that we have in Christ, first thing we see is Jesus gives us freedom from fear. How often do we let fear overcome our life? In so many ways. But if we have had Christ to set us free, then the truth of the matter is, is we have nothing to worry about. We are in His hands. Nothing can take that away. So often we worry about finances. But no, God's got, got that in control. That's why we tithe 10%, because we know God's going to take care of us. That's why whenever we're struggling with disease, we can know that we're okay. We don't have to fear it because if it's our time, we get to go be with Jesus. But he's also the same God that can heal it. When we see a pandemic raging in the world around us, like many others can, can huddle in fear, we have hope. We don't need to fear because our God is in control. We have been set free. Secondly, he also points out in Jesus, we have a freedom from ourselves. 
you think about it, how often do we deal with, with our sinful tendencies, with our weaknesses, with our brokenness? How often are, are we dealing with our, our, our pride and our selfishness? But when Christ works in your life and sets you free from your sin, we find that we can actually start thinking about others. Start thinking about not what I can do for myself, but what I can do for them. What I can do for Jesus. Thirdly, Jesus gives us freedom from others as well. How often do we, do we get scared about what other people think? What other people can do? You know, we live in a world that, especially right now, it's, it's not a positive thing to them to be a Christian, to be a true follower of Jesus. And so it, it's easy to start worrying about our esteem, our cloud, our reputation. But if we've been set free by Christ, we don't care about that anymore. We value what Christ says. We value his opinion more than anything else. And we can disregard any peer pressure the world might put on us. I think the best thing here where we find freedom in Christ is we are given freedom from sin. Now this doesn't mean that, that we are perfect. Because we still struggle. We are all technically in, in, in sin anonymous, as you would call it. We're recovering addicts in that. But that sin doesn't have power over us anymore. We can say no. This reminds me of the, the children's animated movie Aladdin. I don't know if you've ever watched that. And uh, in, in that movie, there's a boy. He finds a lamp. And out of that lamp comes a genie, voiced by Robin Williams. And throughout the course of the movie... The boy has three wishes, and he promises on the third wish to set the genie free. Well, at the end of the movie, he does that. And as soon as he wishes him free, we see that the shackles come off the genie's hands, and he tells the boy, I want you to wish for the Nile River. And the boy says, all right, I wish for the Nile River. And the genie says, no way! He doesn't have to do it anymore. He has been set free. And when sin tempts us because we have been freed by Christ, we can say no way too. No sin, no Satan. Jesus Christ has set me free and you don't have power over me anymore. We are those that no longer fear hell or death. We are no longer those that fear, fear the temptations that come in our lives because Christ has broken our chains. We have been made his children and will dwell in his house forever. And what a wonderful thing that is. That's what encourages us to persevere in our Christian life. To continue to walk in faith, to abide in the word of God as his disciples. That he has set us free. We're no longer powerless against our sin. We can finally fight back. And right now, think about the struggles in your life. What have you been dealing with for years on end, it seems like? You just can't get rid of it. As much and much as you try, you try, you try to follow the Lord, but that sin just keeps popping its ugly head back up. The good news here is that if you can put your faith in Jesus, it no longer has any sway over you. And it's hard to deal with that. But other good news with that is he's also brought us into his church with a bunch of other recovering addicts of sin to come and to help each other. To help take each other's burdens. To help us to walk in a manner worthy of God. To live in a manner that's glorifying to Him. To help each other to overcome the sin in our life. But even greater than one another, we also have Jesus Himself to help us overcome that sin. To help us to fight that good fight of faith. And what that means then is we need to continue to look to Him for that help. If we don't do anything about our problem, well, it's easier to slip back into it, isn't it? We think, oh, well, if I just do it this one time, I'll be fine. I've done that plenty of times when I'm on diets, and let me tell you, I start eating sweets more than I should. The same way with our sin. We have to be daily combating it and looking to the Lord for help to overcome it. That's why then, as Christians, as Jesus says here, that those that truly believe will abide in his word. 
We are to be there looking to him to help us overcome our sin. And that means that we need to take Jesus and take his word and make it central to our lives. That Bible, we need to take it seriously as the rule of faith in our life. We need to continue to grow in that knowledge of who God is here. Knowledge of his truth. And the good news is, is the more and more we do that, the more and more he works in us and enables us to be free from sin and its power. The less and less influence it has, the less and less we slip up, and the more and more we can live like Jesus. What a wonderful thing that is, that Jesus has given us a liberty from sin, not simply to do whatever we want to do, but to do what we couldn't do before, to live for him, the one who ultimately has set us free. This is a wonderful message that Jesus gives us here. And it's hard, but it's also wonderful. And because of that, I think just like the test he gives here to these believers, we need to evaluate ourselves. We may say we're Christians, but what does our life say about us? Does it say that we are still in bondage to our sin? Thinking it's no big deal, sweeping it under the rug. Or does it show that we have looked to Jesus as the one we need that needs to set us free? The one that can free us from sin's power. That can free us from sin's sway. That can free us from sin's consequences and the guilt we have. The one that sets us free to overcome our struggles. Overcome our addictions and our temptations. The one who has set us free to live for him. And to his glory every day. You see, that's the hope that Christ offers all of us here. For our passive minds, is that yes, although we might live in a politically free country, we might live as we please in the center of the free world. We're still not liberated until we come to Jesus. And because of that, may we trust in him so he can break our chains. If we have already trusted in him, may we continue to abide in him that he would help us get the victory over our sins and our addictions that continue to plague us in our life. May this passage be a reminder to each and every one of us, unbeliever, new believer, seasoned believer, that we must turn to Jesus so we can know the truth. The truth as he shows us here that is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That wonderful truth. That by the Son of God. By the truth himself. He may set you free. May your life show that your sh chains have been broken. And may it show your wonderful Savior. Who has emancipated you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, again, we come before you today as slaves who have been set free. We come to you as those that have not broken our chains ourselves, but who have been delivered by the Almighty God, by the wonderful Lord Jesus, who is the truth come into this world to save us. Lord, I pray today that this would remind us of truly how devastating our sin is. That it's not something we should take lightly, but something that we should take seriously. For Lord, we see how it destroys and keeps us captive. Lord, I pray today that all of us would have found freedom in you. May we see that you break our chains. And Lord, that you can offer us a hope that we can find nowhere else. Lord, I pray today that as those that have trusted in you to deliver us from our sin. Lord, may we continue to look to you to overcome that sin in our life. Help us to abide in your word daily, looking to you as our hope, looking to you as the one that can continue to set us free. For Lord, sin no longer has power and dominion over us. And Lord, may you help us today. May you help us to search our hearts and to see where our sin continues to find its way into our life. We might realize it, we might not. But Lord, I pray today that you would help all of us to do so. 
And then, Lord, may you help us to overcome that sin. Lord, may you help us to look to you uh, to defeat it. Help us to look to one another as those that you have brought together uh, to uphold one another in our sin. And to help each other to, to eradicate it. And Lord, I pray that today you would just remind us that even though when we falter, Lord, you have set us free. So, Lord, may that freedom be our hope each day to go out to live for you as the one who has set us free. So, Lord, be with us, bless us, guide us, and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd you to turn with me in red hymnals. Uh, our first hymn is number 500. They will, we'll be singing all the verses. Uh, we have heard the joyful sound. <laughs>
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, being abide with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.